So I'm going to be really real with you right now. Whatever I just went through isn't a joke. I'm not laughing. I'm freaking out. This isn't normal, and I don't even know if I can cope. Some of you all might be able to, but me? I am just not okay with this. I went out two nights ago to this little club in Huntington, West Virginia. My friends and I had a great time, danced a lot, met some new people. It was an all-out good time. I kept myself in the right head the whole night, too, because I knew I had to drive home. And no good time is worth my freedom or my life. Around 1.30 a.m., I finally check the time and I decide I need to head out since I had a seminar at noon. The class I'm in is difficult, so I need all my rest. So I grab some gas and a snack at the little gas station around the corner and I start my 45-minute drive. I'm listening to a random pop station, doing a little drive dancing, nothing too crazy, and singing my heart out. I have all the windows down since it's pretty cool out and the air feels great. So as I'm driving down this little two-lane road, my check engine light comes on. My car starts making a sputtering noise too, so I pull over and turn on my hazards. Now, I'm not a mechanic by any means, but I take a look under the hood. Really, that was just to make myself feel like I was doing something. I'm not going to lie. At this point, I know I have to call AAA or something because I need help. But of course, I didn't have service where I broke down. If I didn't have bad luck, I'd have none at all. There's no one else out at this hour, so I start walking and checking my bars as I go. I looked over at a few cows just standing in this one pasture to my left. They seemed pretty unbothered. Once I got to the end of the pasture, I heard the cows moving around and mooing. They were running in the opposite direction. And I can't lie, I laughed so hard. I'm thinking about how these cows had the most delayed reaction to my presence. I then checked my phone and keep walking past to the end of the pasture, and that's when I saw it. I'm just going to describe it the best that I can, because I've never seen anything like it, and I really hope I don't ever again. Just past the last pasture gate, I saw what I initially thought was a man. The man looked bulky, like maybe he had something on his back. I felt relieved at first, but then fear. My blood ran cold. He didn't have anything on his back. And as I watched, he stretched out wings. This thing was only about six feet tall, but the wings had to be more like nine or ten feet wide. In the moonlight, I could see that they weren't like bird wings exactly. They were like, I don't know, a moth or an ugly butterfly. And they were grayish, dusty color, dark. The thing moved its head slightly, and I think it was to get a better look at me. And when it did, its eyes caught the moonlight, and I could see that they were bright red. I'm not going to lie to you, I started screaming. I tried to dial 911 on my phone, but it didn't connect. I still had no bars, and I'm staring this scary night creature down. I just started panicking. I don't know what to do under stress. I'm not good under stress. I ran back toward my car, and that was the only thing I could think of doing. I didn't hear anything behind me, but I just kept running. I don't know what I thought I was going to do when I got back to the car, but at least it seemed like safety. I dropped my phone, and I had to double back a few steps to find it, and when I looked over into the pasture, I could see the thing standing there. I don't know if it ran or flew there with those big wings, but there it was, just watching me. Once I got my phone, I went right back to running. I could see the cows in the pasture, and they were all bunched up and now mooing loudly. I'm thinking they're probably just as scared as I am and they didn't have anywhere to go. I now felt bad laughing at them earlier. So now I'm maybe 20 feet from my car and I can't even put it into words how scared I was. My phone wasn't picking up a single bar. I knew my car wasn't going to magically start, so I'm going to have to fight this thing. That was the only conclusion I could come to. And then, that's just when I saw headlights. If I wasn't so busy running, I would have cried. I moved to the middle of the road, just running down the yellow dotted line. If they didn't stop, I was going to be a goner. I waved my arms up and down, and I just know I looked crazy. Not as crazy as whatever was stalking me from the pasture, but crazy. So this old man stops, and I didn't want him to not help me, so I didn't say anything about anything chasing me. I needed his help, and I was lucky. I've never been lucky, but I was lucky that day. 
The man had tow straps, and he was able to hook me up. I had to steer my car while he towed me, and when we passed the pasture, I didn't see that thing anywhere. I spent the whole time thinking it was going to pop up in the back seat of my car or something. I stayed at a hotel in the nearest town. I ended up missing my seminar. The local mechanic fixed my car, and they were really nice there. But I don't think I'm ever going to drive through that area again. Nope, I am done meeting my friends at that area ever again. I wish I had been closer to everything that happened. I wish I knew more. If I had been closer, though, I might not have the privilege of sharing this story. They might have realized that I was there, and I saw it happen. They might not have even let me quit my job and stay alive. Up until a year ago, I worked for a very prominent corporation. My role was a small one, just delivering orders in a timely two-day fashion. I covered the northern half of a sprawling American city. I can't give out too many details, I'm sorry. Proper nouns are how people get caught. Most of my deliveries went out to businesses. Very rarely did I travel into the suburbs to make residential drops. My days were fairly routine. I arrived at the distribution center at 4 a.m., loaded my blue van, and headed into the city. Deliveries took all day to complete, and every day was basically the same. And then, one day, my routine changed, and that was the moment I knew that something was wrong. After loading my truck, I was stopped by one of my supervisors. He handed me an additional box, and he asked if I would take it around with me. There was no label, no address describing where the box was going to or coming from. It wasn't paid for by any type of postage or stamp. It was an unremarkable box, half the size of a basketball. The cardboard packaging was colored black, and I had never seen a box quite like it. When I asked where the package was going, my supervisor just waved me off. They assured me that it wasn't a delivery. I simply needed to carry the box with me along my route. They promised that other drivers had done so in the past. It was simply my turn, they explained. They said the box hadn't seen the northern half of the city just yet. Now the way they described that was concerning. The way they said the box hadn't seen the city. I figured they had just misspoken, but I never clarified, thinking it was just a simple mistake. In my mind, they were testing some new GPS product that would likely be installed in our vehicles in the future and they were keeping it in the box to keep anybody from tampering with it. The bonus they told me about, if I completed this trip without damage to the package, was more than enough to seal the deal for me. So I drove around with my little black box. I kept it with me on the passenger seat. I wanted to have my eyes on it, obviously. When I stopped for lunch, I started to doubt my GPS theory, though, because after spending time with it, I could tell that the package was humming. As I was sitting there in my seat, working my way through a slice of pizza, I kept glancing over at the box, and I almost jumped out of the van when it vibrated. I nearly dropped my slice, and for a few seconds I was convinced that I had been tricked into smuggling a bomb on board my van. When it didn't explode, I figured I was overreacting because it stopped humming once I finished my meal. In my mind, I joked with myself that the box was just hungry, envious of my lunch break. Either that or else it was impatient and wanted to get back on the road. For some reason, that idea stuck with me. Was this package keeping its own schedule? I then returned back to the distribution facility at the end of the day, and a different supervisor retrieved the box from my vehicle. They thanked me for a job well done and carried the package out of sight. As I handed it to them, I asked what it was. I even pitched my GPS theory. The question earned me a glare and a long period of silence. I quickly apologized and left for the day. That reaction now had me determined, though. I was now wanting to find out what was inside that box. I spoke to the other drivers, and I learned pretty quickly which of them had already given the box a tour of their delivery route. So that narrowed down who would be escorting the package next. I kept my eye on those drivers who would be next. 
I then watched as one of them received the box and drove it around without incident. The next driver, however, was not so lucky. I arrived at the facility early that afternoon. I had rushed through my deliveries and skipped lunch so that I could arrive before this next driver. I wanted to see him hand off the box. Instead, when he pulled in, I watched as he jumped out of his driver's seat, screaming. I kept my distance. I ducked into my own van and I hunched down a bit behind the windshield. I wanted to watch as best as I could, but I did not want to get caught. I watched as the frantic driver was tackled by security. I didn't even know we had security that could deal with that kind of thing. They pinned him to the ground and bound his hands. And might I say that they looked very professional while doing it. That driver was then carried away, hogtied. I guess they even knocked him unconscious somehow. And then next I watched as my supervisors rushed into his truck and brought out the box. I could see from my seat that the black cardboard had been torn open. They were all obviously scared. They were all on their cell phones and moving so hurriedly that I wasn't surprised when two of them collided. This caused the box to fall, and I could see something tumble out. It was shaped like a small pyramid. Most of it was silver, the color of steel, and the way the light hit it, I'm confident that it was metal. But what I could not understand were the veins. These thin green streaks ran across the surface of this pyramid thing. It looked like a leaf or thinly stretched skin. The streaks were pulsating too, throbbing. Watching it made my head ache. Whatever it was was scooped back into its box and the team of supervisors all scurried off to their offices. Someone was going to be upset with them, I could tell. But I could also tell that the pyramid thing was not ours. It didn't look like any piece of technology that I had ever seen, and plenty had passed through my hands. When the other driver, the one who broke the box, didn't come back to work, I knew something was very wrong. I knew my company was hiding something. I instantly decided to quit, and I let things get quiet. But your channel, Lilith, has given me a unique opportunity. I've taken all the measures I need to stay safe. And I think that you and your followers deserve to know about this. You can spread the word and you can warn others without endangering me. I think the big corporations out there are working for somebody else. Maybe the government. Maybe something even bigger. I think that they're driving around and scanning our cities. I think they're preparing for something, and I don't know what it is. I just know that if I stay silent, none of us will be ready for it. When you read this, I know you're going to think I'm insane. That I couldn't have seen what I think I did, but I have zero explanation. I know we didn't imagine it, and I just hope that your listeners will believe my story if you select it. Deer season was always my best friend Andy's favorite time of year. We live in western Pennsylvania, where it's a huge pastime. As a kid, we even used to get the first day of deer hunting off of school because so many kids would have been absent otherwise. Andy would even schedule his vacation off from work at this time just so we could go rifle hunting. I can honestly say that I never cared for it, but he loved it, and as a good friend, I would tag along. I had to hand it to him, too. The woods during rifle season are the quietest and the most peaceful times ever especially when it snows. I love the snow, and the deer blind that we would use would keep us just warm enough that the afternoon didn't stink too bad. We hadn't seen too many deer on this particular afternoon, even using the deer call. That wasn't too unusual, I guess, but Andy was getting discouraged. We took turns with the call and the binoculars. I was actively looking, but having no luck. So we decided that we would hang out for a few more hours, and we both agreed maybe just one more hour. I was actually enjoying the way the sun was reflecting on the snow and the way that the snow muted every normal sound. It was so relaxing to me. I watched through the binoculars as a small deer slowly came into sight. Andy was saving his tags for bigger games, so I knew he didn't want to take the shot. As dusk started to settle, Andy got restless. He was very frustrated that we had spent another day without even taking one shot. I was personally annoyed at his frustration. 
I rolled my eyes and I started to gather my stuff to head out, but I stopped as a big buck came within range. I slapped at Andy's arm, trying to get his attention, and I pointed. As he lined up the shot, I watched through the binoculars, ensuring that there was nothing in the way. I nodded, and Andy breathed in and out, slowly, waiting for the perfect moment. A moment that never came. As I watched, a figure appeared out of the brush. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I shook my head and held out my hand for him to wait. I then rubbed my eyes, trying to clear my vision because obviously I was hallucinating. But no, it was still there. The figure was tall, way taller than the buck that we were watching. Andy lowered the barrel of his rifle, grabbed his own set of binoculars, and I could see that he too was gaping at the figure. It was covered in light brown hair all over, kind of like it was wearing a fur coat, but different. The creature walked upright. That much was very clear and very disturbing. I watched, shocked, as it slowly walked. Amazingly, the deer didn't even flinch. I couldn't understand what was going on. How could this buck not be freaked out? Andy was just as stunned. He kept looking back and forth between me and the creature, and finally he mouthed at me, What is going on? I just shook my head, back and forth. What else could I do? I didn't want to draw attention to us. We sat there for probably another 20 minutes as this thing just hung out, not leaving the area but walking around a bit. I wasn't about to try to sneak out of the blind and leave as long as it was still out there. Things were so tense that when a twig snapped nearby, I almost wet my pants. I jumped, dropped the binoculars, and looked over at Andy. He just shrugged and shook his head. He didn't know what it could have been either. By the time we looked back through the binoculars to see how it was reacting to our noise, it had disappeared. Neither one of us felt like we could leave yet. I was scared that the creature would show back up, thinking that maybe it was now closer to us, but not at all sure where it was. And also, how dangerous it might be. Obviously, I didn't want to find that out. We knew we couldn't wait forever, though, and eventually we had to climb down and head to the truck. That did not make anything easier. But eventually we did it. We climbed down, each of us watching out for the other as we did, scanning the surrounding area. My nerves were fried. I didn't like it at all that we were now on the ground, either, and we didn't have the same view of the entire area like we did up in the blind but I knew we had to get to the truck before it got any colder. As we began the trek back, every little sound made us jump, stop, and quickly look around. We didn't feel safe in the woods at all at that point, and that feeling only ramped up when I realized that we were being watched. We couldn't see it, but the hair on the back of my neck was standing on edge, and I knew it could see us. I told Andy to hurry up. We needed to get to the truck fast. He swung his gun off of his shoulder, ready to use it if we needed it, and he motioned for me to go ahead of him. I could see the trees starting to thin out ahead of us, and it felt like we were finally in the home stretch. But that's when the smell hit me. I was hit with the scent of wet dog. I gagged, and I looked around. Maybe somebody's pet had found a pond and needed help, but there was nothing. I glanced over my shoulder at Andy. He was looking to our left with his mouth hanging wide open. I followed his eyes to where he was looking and screamed. The creature was right there. It was so close to us that when it growled, I could feel the vibrations in my chest. I grabbed Andy's arm and took off running. We made it to the truck, stumbled in the snow a bit, slammed the doors as loud as we could, all while listening to whooping filling the air. Andy threw the truck in gear. We sped off. I have not gone hunting since. What happened to me happened in my last year of college at the University of Utah while studying for a degree in conservation. Instead of going home for winter break, I signed up for a short internship shadowing a park ranger. It was only going to last a month, and the park ranger I was going to be working with had a station next to a huge ski resort. I'll say right now that I'm an avid skier and I had been hoping to do more skiing than working, but that didn't end up being the case. I had less than a week left on my internship when we got a call about an animal in distress somewhere along the road towards the ski resort. 
Ironically, that's the last place I wanted to be. I think I had maybe gone skiing twice since the whole ordeal started, and I felt like the universe was laughing at me at this point. I can't really complain about the job, though. It's exactly what I signed up for, and Noah was a great guy to work for. I just wished I would have been working maybe a little less, especially over the holidays. When we got in the ranger truck, I asked Noah about the details of the animal incident. Usually when we get a call like this, it's a collision with a vehicle. Sometimes we can help the animal and take it to a rehab center, but sometimes we can't. I felt relieved when Noah said that it wasn't a vehicle accident. He said reports had come in from multiple people going to and from the resort. They had either heard or saw a puppy crying for help, but no one could catch it. I asked Noah why we got called instead of animal control. He said it was because there's no animal control out there, and who knows, it might actually be a fox or something. Plus, we weren't doing anything else. Don't get me wrong, I'd much rather search for a lost puppy than see a mangled deer with two broken legs from a vehicle collision. Actually, though, I'd rather be skiing. We finally reached the area where the sightings had been reported, and we searched everywhere. And I mean everywhere. We probably looked for two hours, but still no puppy. Noah drove us to the ski resort to get some coffee and warm up a little after spending nearly two hours outside. I figured by this point we had tried our best, but was starting to feel that we were going to have to give up on the puppy. But Noah wasn't willing to throw in the towel just yet. We finished our coffee, and Noah ordered two sausage patties to go. I was still silently hoping that we had given up and I might get a couple of runs down the mountain today, but it looked like we were going to be setting a live trap with fresh sausage as bait. We drove back to the location where the puppy was last seen, and we set the trap up a little ways away from the road and behind the cover of a few trees. Noah put the sausages in the trap and said, I don't know if we're going to catch it, but I guarantee something is going to be in here in the morning. He was right. We drove out first thing in the morning to check the trap. You could see the trap from the road, and the creature that was in it was a little husky puppy, pure white with blue eyes. There were tracks around the trap, too, but tracks of something much larger than the puppy. They looked canine in nature, so I asked Noah if they looked like wolf tracks, but he said no, that these were bigger than wolf tracks. Well, is it some type of a big dog then? I asked. Dogs don't get that big either, he said. We didn't discuss the tracks any further. We just took the puppy to the truck and drove it back to the ranger station. In retrospect, that was a mistake I will not soon forget. The puppy was skittish and disinterested in us. We set it up in a pen at the ranger station and put out a notice that we had found it, hoping to reunite it with its owner. Noah and I had some other outside work to do that day, and so we left it alone at the station. It wasn't a great situation, but at least it was warm and it had access to food and water. Work then ran a little longer than usual, and we didn't get back to the station until after dark. Nothing exciting kept us out, just a couple of trees that needed to be cleared off the public access road. And when we got to the station, we both looked at the front door and froze. There were claw marks all up and down the door. Luckily, the door was still latched, but just barely. Noah told me to stay back, stay in the truck, but I didn't. So we both walked up to the door. Whatever had made those marks was big, like the size of a bear. We didn't see any tracks leading up to the building, so we had no way of identifying what it was, though. So then we went into the station. Everything was in place. The door had held and had managed to keep whatever was out there out. And amazingly, the white husky puppy was still there, looking like it was waiting for dinner. Noah and I stayed at the station for another hour doing our end-of-day paperwork, and he told me I could go home if I wanted, but he was going to stay a bit longer. My car was parked around the side of the building, and I was about to get in it when I noticed tracks leading up to the window of the ranger station. It was obvious that whatever had made them had been looking in at us. I examined the tracks closer, and I was certain that they were from the same animal that had earlier been hanging around the trap. So I ran back inside to tell Noah, but he stopped me as soon as I opened the door. He had been coming for me, too, and he whispered to be quiet because he had heard something strange outside. From the inside, I could hear it walking through the snow just on the other side of the wall. 
and then there was a thud as I heard it jump onto the porch. Noah and I were both afraid to breathe at this point, and then the damn puppy started howling. And then, as if responding to the cries of the puppy, the creature outside stood up and looked through the window. I only saw it for a brief moment before I fell to the floor, but it looked like some sort of a wolfman-type creature, with hair that was pure white and piercing blue eyes, the same blue eyes as the puppy. Noah looked over at me, and I knew from the look on his face that he had made the connection, too. If it wasn't for Noah, I'm pretty sure I would have been attacked outside by this creature. He used his key remote to set off the alarm on the ranger truck, and that was enough to scare the beast away from the building for at least a second. Believe me, we used that second to open the station door and let the puppy out. And that was it. All the commotion ended immediately. The creature left, and it never came back. And to this day, there have been no future sightings of it or the puppy. No one expects to have something unexplainable happen to them. Days go by in routine, work and errands become a blur. No one expects to have something unexplainable happen to them. Every day goes by in routine, work and errands become a blur, and self-care becomes an afterthought. But then, the unexplainable happens. Maybe an accident shakes the foundation of your life. Maybe the company you work for suddenly goes belly up. Or maybe you just see something. That's what happened to me. I looked where I shouldn't have. I stared when I should have blinked. I don't think I'm the only person guilty of that. The weird and the tragic have a way of pulling you in. Even I wasn't immune to that kind of gravity. I used to take long walks, through the city or across the surrounding wilderness. I didn't care where. Stretching my legs helped me think. It cleared my mind, it settled my nerves. I would have dealt with my stress in a different way, but how could I have known better? This particular walk had taken me into the woods. It was a wet fall and the trees were empty and the ground was a cold sludge. The sticky, slurping sound on the bottom of my shoes didn't even slow me down. I was enjoying my day with nature. I listened for the birds that day, but heard nothing. And then I looked for animal tracks, but the mud was empty. They'd all gone home, I guessed. But I did ultimately hear a whirring sound. A loud chopping of the wind. Not unlike the sound of helicopter blades. But there wasn't a landing site for miles, so if it was a helicopter... They must have been coming down in an emergency, so I ran to see if I could help. But before I could reach the site of the whirring blades, the sound stopped, and the forest became eerily quiet, as if I was the only one left in the trees. And then next I heard this sharp hissing sound, something like a hydraulic press unburdening itself of a massive weight. Whoever or whatever it was, it was still nearby. And then I smelled it before I saw it. Linen and bleach. It wasn't altogether unpleasant, but just out of place in the trees. Why would this stretch of the woods smell so medicinal? I pulled the neckline of my shirt up to cover my nose, and I continued. Nothing extreme had happened, but my curiosity was already piqued, and I needed to know. The smell got stronger as I moved. I gagged, and I spit, and I leaned against a tree to try to catch my breath. Whatever I was looking for, it had a fully realized arsenal to use against me. My forearm remained propped on the nearest tree as I heaved and cried. The smell was too strong, and it felt like I had been thrown in the washer with a bottle of detergent and the spin cycle was going. I threw up. It then made me feel better, but when I looked up, wiping the excess from my lips, I spotted the source of the smell. It wasn't a helicopter. It was a small man, or it was a small thing shaped like a man, I could see. This thing, I don't think it was human. It stood with a hunch, and the creature's arms hung so low that its fingers nearly dragged on the ground. Its back was covered by this large, mucus-like bubble, and its face was more frog than human. Wide-set eyes and a wide mouth, unblinking, unfazed as it looked my way. I don't know if I was paralyzed by fear or disoriented by the horrible stench, but I couldn't bring myself to turn away. I couldn't run. 
The thing tilted its head like a curious dog, and the expression was so familiar to me, so harmless that I almost laughed. Almost. My motor functions slowly returned. I can't say why without admitting that I'm an idiot, but I moved toward the thing. I took an entire step forward. Its face then twisted into something like a scowl, and the bubble on its back swelled, and the cruel scent got more intense. I imagined streaks of the odorous weapon rising from the creature's spine. I couldn't keep myself from coughing. This time the fit brought me to my knees. I landed on my palms, facing the ground, and I heard the creature's heavy footfalls run in the opposite direction. It didn't mean to harm me, I decided. And when I could breathe again, all I wanted to do was see it again. The wonder and the fear had quickly faded. I wanted a picture of the thing. I followed its tracks in the mud. Strangely, its feet were grooved like the soles of a shoe. I didn't remember it wearing anything on its feet. I pursued the footprints and the scent as quickly as I could, slowed down only by the occasional wretch. I wasn't lucky enough to see the creature again, however... I had already found its escape route, but what I saw wasn't the beast, but an orb, a light, blinding white light, as bright as the sun on a summer day shining in the middle of the woods. I shielded my eyes trying to get a glimpse of the orb through the cracks in my fingers, and I tried raising my phone to take a picture, but the screen only came back white. And then the chopping sound returned, chop, 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 from the exact location of the orb. I felt the wind kick up and collide with my face, and then the sphere was gone, and I heard the hydraulic whine. The light seemed to jump, and then nothing. I was alone, dizzy, and sweating. The taste of bile still coated my tongue. Later, the authorities said that I had caught a fever in the woods. The doctors backed them up. Dehydration and disorientation compounded into an intense waking dream. That's what they said. If I did hallucinate, I haven't done so since. I found very little information on the creature that I saw that day. That encounter remains my one truly unexplainable day of my life. Do you have any theories? Thanks, Lilith. When I was a kid, I lived in a small town near the Oregon coast. It was quiet there, and nothing very exciting ever really happened. From our house, you could look in one direction and see ocean in the distance, and the other direction was all forest. I would listen to the stories from our old neighbors sitting around campfires after a few beers. They would talk about stuff that they claimed to have seen in the woods. A lot of times they would tell about Sasquatch and footprints the size of a man's chest, or the howl that sounded like nothing else they had ever heard. I kind of thought they were making things up because it was such an uneventful place, and things could get pretty boring. But I've never seen or heard any strange creatures like that. I had been playing in the woods since I was little, and I didn't know anything different. I was pretty poor as a child, like a lot of people in the area. I learned how to supplement our food with foraging and hunting. I think it served me well. I feel like I could survive a considerable while if I had to. I know that sometimes people who grow up like that end up wanting to go live in the big city or the real world, but I really liked that low-key life. We had relatives in Northern California in Crescent City. When we visited them, we would usually also end up going down to Redwood National Park, and it became my favorite place in the whole world. All that greenish light in the middle of those giant trees was so magical to me. That feeling stuck with me so much that I ended up working as a park ranger there when I grew up. There was never really any other career that I would have even considered. There aren't that many jobs that let you make a living in the middle of the forest. So one day I was out hiking on my day off. I had spent most of my week working in visitor services, so I definitely needed some quiet time to myself. I had been out there for a few hours, and I was deep enough in that the only trails around me were ones made by deer and elk. The moss and brush muted all the sounds of my footsteps, and when a bird would call out, it would sound so loud, almost like a siren or something. I was heading up to the chanterelle mushroom patch that I had found a couple of weeks prior. I only knew how to get back there by following a trail of surveyor ribbon that I had left on branches and trees. 
I found the patch and I spent a good while picking mushrooms. I got a good bunch of them with no slug marks or mushy spots. I was satisfied with my haul and I was about ready to head back. But right about then, I started feeling just really odd. You know that feeling when something is watching you but you can't tell from where or what it is? I remember there being a strange smell of sulfur in the air. I got goosebumps and my skin started tingling. A feeling in my gut wanted me to run, but I didn't. I looked around and I listened. I didn't hear anything, so I went back to filling my pack. That feeling was freaking me out, but I was determined to get home with my harvest. I was trying to hurry. I had definitely seen bear scat in the area before, and I really didn't want a face-off. The creepy feeling was also intensifying, and I looked back over my shoulder again. And this time, I screamed. There was a figure there, probably no more than 20 feet behind me. The best I can compare it to is what you imagine when you try to picture a gray alien. I know how that sounds, and I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. It was about four feet or something, and it was wearing this metallic, transparent, or reflective material. It was standing very still, and that, combined with its clothing, maybe that's why I didn't notice it. It was almost blending into the trees. The only thing that moved was its face, and I felt like it was giving me these aggressive, disapproving looks. Maybe it was angry that I had noticed it. The face was gray, and the skin was wrinkled around the eyes, which were huge and black. I couldn't distinguish any other facial features. It didn't make any sound, either. We were just staring at each other, and I was locked in place with fear. I had this feeling that while it was looking at me, it was trying to get inside my head, if you know what I mean. But the next part was incomprehensible to me. I have no idea why, but the fear went away as quickly as it came. I finished up, and I turned my back to it. I felt okay now, and I walked away. It was a peaceful walk back, but as soon as I sat down in my truck, I felt pretty freaked out again. It was like the whole encounter had been temporarily frozen and everything was normal, but once I sat down and thought about it, I realized how absolutely insane it was. I was questioning my sanity a little bit. I did some reading on greys after that incident, but I haven't come across anyone who had that experience of the fear just disappearing like I did. I was hoping maybe one of your listeners might have some insight into this encounter. It had seemed so mentally aggressive, and then it just kind of released me. I haven't become afraid of the woods or anything, and I still love my job. But when I think back on all those stories that the old-timers used to tell when I was a kid, I think I believe them now. I was about 10 years old when my family moved to a new house just outside of San Antonio, Texas. At the time, I didn't know how much history the city had, but later on, it would all make sense. Summer had just started, so I wasn't able to make friends through school. There was an overrun park just down the street that had a swing set in decent condition. After I unpacked a bit, I decided to head down to the park, hoping some local neighborhood kids would be there. I sat on the swing for a bit before the summer heat really started to get to me. I was about to make my way home when I heard jingles coming from the opposite end of the park. A local ice cream man was pushing his cart toward me, and I thought some cold refreshment could cool me down. I waved at him from a distance, and I searched through my pockets for some change. As I approached him, my eyes scanned the cart, seeing the different options. The treats he had were ones I was familiar with, but the logos looked different. I reluctantly settled for a popsicle and asked how much. He told me it was only five cents, so I quickly gave him a nickel, and he walked away. I thought it was weird that the popsicle cost so little, but I figured things were just cheap in the area. I shrugged, and I watched the man walk away. I noticed his attire seemed odd, too, like his clothes were old and out of style. He had on this crinkly cowboy hat stained with sweat, and his shoes were made of what looked like wicker. I wondered why his cart had wooden wheels, too, instead of rubber. They were loud. I turned the other way and I sat back down on the swing to enjoy the popsicle, and when I looked up, I noticed he was gone. Perhaps he took a shortcut or was in a hurry to get out of the heat. After I finished, I went ahead and made my way home, 
and I thought about the man I encountered all throughout the night. I couldn't help thinking that he seemed somehow out of place, and I made up my mind to return to the park tomorrow in hopes that I would see him again. When I woke the next morning, I was forced to run errands with my mom. I was eager to get home so I could get to the park and hopefully catch him again. Then it was about 3 p.m. when we finally got home, and I ran to the park. I sat on the swing just as I had before, but there was no sign of him today. I waited for nearly an hour, pacing around, kicking up rocks. Part of me wanted to know more, and the other part of me just simply wanted the ice cream. I was about to give up for the day when I heard laughter coming from across the park. My head perked up, and I started to walk over. When I got closer, I discovered a boy and a girl, both around my age, playing some sort of a game. Each had a large wooden hoop with a wooden stick and they would roll the wooden hoop and push it along with the stick. My eyes lit up at the opportunity to make new friends, so I approached them asking if I could play too. And at first, they seemed startled and hid behind one another. I told them I had just moved in down the street and I wanted to learn the game they were playing. They didn't speak, but I knew they understood because they handed me the hoop and a stick. One demonstrated and I followed along. We ended up playing until sunset and they waved goodbye before running to the end of the park and out of sight. I walked home with a smile on my face, happy that I had made new friends. And then over the course of the following week, I returned to the park each day to play with the two of them. I remembered each time that they appeared to be in the same clothes. They were white clothes that looked dingy and unwashed. As a kid, your manners aren't fully there, so I asked them why their clothes were dirty. And even though there was a language barrier, by my hand gestures, I knew they understood. The boy was able to tell me in broken English, no water. I tilted my head, confused, and I asked if they needed water. Both reluctantly nodded, so I made my way home to fill up an old paint bucket with water from our house. But by the time I made my way back, they were nowhere to be found. I ventured over to the edge of the park where I had seen them run to before. And the closer I got, I was able to make out the remains of a brick house almost like it was forgotten with time, tucked away at the back of the neighborhood. The roof was caved in and half of the home was knocked down. Wooden baskets and toys were scattered throughout, and the brick chimney was the only thing that seemed to be fully intact. Among the mess of bricks, I noticed a few old mattresses punctured with holes and looking moldy. As I made my way through the ruins, I saw a wooden wheel on the floor and next to it an old beaten ice cream cart. It was the same one I had seen the ice cream man pushing the other day. I was spooked, so I ran out of the ruins as fast as I could. It was the exact cart I had seen the man pushing. I'm sure of it. I ran all the way home, and I had no intention of ever returning to that park. I never went back, but I knew for sure that the man and the children I met were in fact ghosts of the people who lived there long ago. Over the years, I would walk past the park on my way to and from school, and when I finally graduated high school, they ended up knocking down those ruins and building a new, full-functioning playground. I only ever told my wife about the events, and she was a native to the area. It was only then that I learned that San Antonio had many Mexican and Spanish settlers who came to the area in the 1800s. I believed I had encountered one of those families. And I wonder if they still linger at that same park to this day. I had been working as a maintenance man at the Blessed Hill Cemetery for 25 years. It wasn't how I had pictured my life going, but I sort of fell into the position after my stint at community college. And I quickly learned it wasn't a bad gig. I started every day the same way. I would pull up to the wrought iron gates just after dawn, and then I would go about the morning managing the grounds sometimes mild landscape work, sometimes controlling pests, often dealing with grieving mourners. All in all, it was a mixed bag of daily objectives, but it was never anything too draining. Well, until that one night. I typically ended my workday just after sunset, and that's when we shut and locked the gates, and the mourners at Blessed Hill knew when we closed. But if they lingered, I'd give them about half an hour leeway. So once the last visitor left the cemetery, I began my closing rounds. 
This was basically one final lap around the cemetery to make sure that there were no stragglers. Sometimes there were. The worst was when it was a group of kids, usually thugs from the nearby consolidated high school. They seemed to think that they could pull one over on me, but they were wrong. I had no problem calling the authorities on those who disrespected the rules of the land. I had, on a couple of separate occasions, dealt with that group of punks. They would sneak onto the property once they saw my truck pass, the final bend, thinking that they had hidden out long enough, and then they would start up with their nonsense. It was just plain disrespectful to drink and cause debauchery on the graves of the deceased, but those kids didn't care, so I'd let them think that they had their moment before pulling up with a squad car behind me. That was enough to send them running. So when I started my closing rounds, I wasn't entirely surprised to see a pair of individuals sulking in the shadows of the furthest plot. I couldn't tell by their faces, so I drove over to investigate. As my truck approached, I felt uneasy, which was unusual. They were two individuals dressed identically in black robes, and when I called out to them from my rolled-down window, they slowly turned their heads around to look at me. They looked both young and ancient at the same time. The skin on their faces was dull, and it lacked any vibrance. I had seen similar expressions on the faces of mourners before, but those were markedly sad. The expressions before me now were unplaceable. They were anticipating something. Since they weren't the punks I thought they were, I calmly reminded them that the cemetery was now closed. They could take a few more minutes, but then it was time to go. They could come back tomorrow. I couldn't tell if they registered my words. They stared back at me blankly. The pressure with which they looked at me with their unwavering eyes made me sweat. I nervously laughed, and I decided to finish my round. If they were still there afterward, I'd be a little sterner. As I finished my lap around the grounds, I'd see nobody, no punks or junkies. That was a good sign. But the two black-cloaked mourners were still exactly where they had been before, when I circled back 20 minutes later. I groaned, silently to myself. I didn't take any pleasure in this part of the job. I got out of my truck with a huff and I strolled over to the two figures. Their backs were turned to me now, and they hunched over a tombstone, whispering in indecipherable statements. I tried to call out with a hey from a few feet behind, but they didn't acknowledge in the slightest. It was starting to get dark by then, too, and I didn't like dealing with stragglers, much less after sundown. I tried calling out to them again, with no luck. I finally reached out and I put my hand gently on the back of one of their shoulders, and immediately both heads turned toward me. They turned 180 degrees. I instinctively jumped back in shock. The pallid faces hissed in unison at me, revealing a set of sharp, upper canines as white as snow. The shadows fell into the deep contours of their identical faces, giving them this emaciated look of immortality. I put my hands up in defense, wishing that I had made the stupid call to the sheriff's office before any of this had started up. But I don't even know what the sheriff would have done to help. These things just turned their head completely around. I was suddenly very scared. I had never felt scared working here, just annoyed and taxed by the locals. But the way that these two figures commanded my attention was unlike anything else I had ever seen. I tried to speak, but their hissing cut me off. I couldn't place why I thought this, but I just had this feeling that they were telling me to leave, to stop bothering them, like they had business there that I had no part in. And a big part of me just accepted that. I was just doing my job here, and I think they were too, whatever that job was. So I nervously took a step back, and when they did not pursue me, I took that as a sign to get the hell out of there. I hopped in my truck, and I sped around the loop, back towards the gates. I stole one final look back at the pair, and an overwhelming dread came over me. I haven't seen those two since, thank God. I don't know who they were, or what they were doing there, but I have a feeling that it is best not to go digging for the truth, when you know It'll scare the faith out of you. I just want to say how much of a relief it has been to listen to your channel. I feel so much more relaxed and I don't feel insane. 
I'll be 100% honest, though, that doesn't mean I'm relaxed enough to ever explore any mountain, cave, or even just wilderness again. Like, ever. Sometimes I don't even want to leave my house based on what I've seen. My family thinks I'm crazy, and my friends think I'm being ridiculous for attention. And the police. They literally told me that I needed to think of a better prank and hire a therapist. I'll tell you exactly what I've seen. I'm sure you will believe me. There needs to be awareness out there, like everywhere. Anyway, here goes. I traveled about two and a half hours from my home to do some exploring in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm not big on hiking or whatever, but I recently went through a breakup. I just wanted some fresh air and maybe even some nice nature pictures for my Instagram. A nice adventure, I suppose. I parked and just started wandering. I didn't follow a specific path. I created my own. My phone was set to track my path so that I wouldn't get lost. Technology is great. As I was wandering, I got some pretty nice pictures of some gigantic trees, some cool-looking spiderwebs, and even a little snake. I was really enjoying myself, making my own way, and just breathing. So I'd been going for about two hours when I saw this large hole in one of the mountain walls. It wasn't too far from me, and it was a manageable climb. So I climbed up, and when I got to the hole, I stuck my head in, and it was dark. So I turned on my phone's flashlight, and that's when I realized this was a deep cave. I got a little carried away thinking about how I had discovered a cave, wondering if anybody else had ever been up here. It was sort of exciting. Of course, I ducked down and I walked in. I went in a few feet. I was being super careful, but I could see a smooth rock floor beneath me. I felt safe. So I kept walking forward, following the light from my flashlight taking a picture here and there. So I was maybe 15 or 16 feet in when I realized I was in a cavern, a cave room. There were a few openings in the walls surrounding the cavern. I picked the closest one to me and I looked in. It was another tunnel. I could tell it was big enough to walk through, so I stepped through the opening and I carefully walked a few more feet. And that's when I heard skittering. I stopped walking, thinking maybe I had kicked something. And I looked all around, but saw nothing. I then heard the skittering again, and when I raised my phone up to look ahead of me, I saw a person. Only, like, not a person. It was fully nude, and it looked really malnourished. It was crouched down on its hands and feet about four feet in front of me. So pale, like maybe it had never, ever even seen the sun. Its face was sunken in, and I could clearly see the cheekbones. It had all black eyes, not just the pupils like us, but all black. Between its hands on the ground was a half-eaten rabbit. I don't want to get too detailed because some people may have weak stomachs, but honestly, I thought I might vomit. I heard the skittering sound again, and I realized that it was making that noise. I don't know how I knew, but it was calling for its friends or family. Back up. I don't know. But it was trying to communicate and not with me. I moved back toward the way I came, but I kept my flashlight on it. It didn't seem to like the light too much. It didn't even try to move towards me at all. I was able to get back through the hole, and I took a look around, and I didn't see anything else. I then ran for my life back the way I came, and I could hear the skittering, and it was getting closer and louder. There had to be more than just one. I felt like that rabbit must have. Like I was feeling like I was being hunted. I was able to see the light from the original opening when I tripped. I dropped my phone, and I'm not going to lie, I didn't even try to pick it up. I got myself right on up and got out of that hole. I ran down that mountain. I was panting so hard, but my adrenaline would not let me stop. I only stopped when I was sure nothing had followed me. I realized I had no phone and no idea where I was, but honestly, I was just happy to be alive. I did eventually find a trail, and I managed to make it back to my car. I went to the local police station, which was pointless. They wouldn't take me seriously, so I just drove home. I cried and screamed so much on that drive. And when I got home, I checked my phone's location. When I used the satellite feature, all I could see was a heavily wooded area. No cave mouth. 
The last time I checked the location of my phone, it had moved over a mile away from its original place, the place I dropped it. It only had about 3% battery left, so I'm sure it's long died since. And that's what happened. I feel like I could have been eaten in there. I'm so lucky that I didn't freeze up. I honestly wish I had taken a picture when I first saw that pale person. I didn't even think about that. All of my other pictures uploaded to the cloud. Anyway, please guys, don't go into any unexplored caves. I mean, even caves that have been explored are probably dangerous. I know I'll never go in one. I'm nervous writing this. No one ever wants to be the person that saw something unbelievable. I mean, I certainly never wanted to be that person, and yet, here I am. I live in southern Georgia. I won't tell you my exact location because I don't want anyone to pinpoint who I am. Plus, it could be dangerous here. No one needs to come around here trying to track things down. I own a decent little cabin on the outskirts of town. The main reason I bought it is because of the wraparound porch. The backside of my cabin overlooks a creek, and my entire property spans 12 wooded acres, so it's my own private getaway. I do work a high-paced job at my local ER, so having the view that I have gives me some nice quiet time. I see deer often. I've also seen a wild cat and even a few bears. Mostly deer, though. I leave out corn near the creek for the deer. If you didn't know, deer love corn, especially if it's still on the cob. I get to sit out back and watch the wildlife and listen to the creek, and it helps me relax after 24-plus hours at the hospital. I noticed about three weeks ago that the corn I was leaving out, though, was not being touched. This did happen a while back when we had a big old black bear roaming the area. He didn't stay long, and the deer came back to munch on the corn eventually a few days later. Anyway, this morning, I came home as usual, and when I pulled up my driveway, I could see that my trash can had been dumped over and there was trash everywhere. Sometimes raccoons or even bear will get into the trash, but we've never had that much of a mess. This was crazy. Containers and bottles were opened, and it seemed like things had been separated into gross trash piles. I grabbed a few trash bags and some gloves so I could pick it all up, which was pretty annoying, but it was my fault for forgetting to put the lock on it the last time I brought the trash out. So I go inside and I take a shower, and then I decide to make myself breakfast. Nothing crazy. Toast and scrambled eggs. Orange juice. It was still pretty cool out, so I decided to go sit on the back porch. Just relax and maybe check on the deer. But I was pretty darn wrong. I sat down at my little patio table, just like I have a million other times, ready to eat and thinking about some yoga, and then I smelled something terrible. It was this rancid mix of hot, unwashed armpits and dirty, wet dog. I gagged it was so bad. And then I heard the growling that was coming from the corner of the porch. I look, and there was this huge man, gigantic, honestly. He was at least 10 feet tall, covered in black, coarse hair, but not on its face. And I could see the beady black eyes as clear as day. He was angry and had huge, ape-like hands balled up in a fist. As I was watching, he let out this loud roar from his mouth, which really didn't look much different than a human's mouth. But its teeth were very large and yellow, and I could smell the breath from where I was standing. My brain was just trying to process what I was looking at, and for some reason, I wasn't scared. I just knew that I had two options, fight or flight. I looked at the thing, and then I motioned to my plate, and I started backing away slowly. I knew I had my cell phone in my pocket so I could use the automated entry to get through the front door when the thing roared again, but luckily, it did not move towards me. I felt like it could probably move fast based on how large it was. The feet were humongous, just like it. And then I said, you can have the food. I don't really want it. Don't ask me why I said that. I know it's insane. I thought that hours later. But me telling a strange creature on my back porch that I'm not hungry? Yeah, that's weird. I backed around the corner and I moved quickly to the front door. I did not hear the thing follow me, which I'm still thankful for. I unlocked the door and I went inside. I locked and bolted the door from the inside to keep it out. 
and then I stopped at the hall closet, grabbed a can of bear mace, luckily I had bought it back when I was worried about that big black bear, and then I went straight to the back door and locked and bolted it too. Even now, I'm not sure that it would have kept the thing out if it had wanted to come inside, but so far, it's working. I then did peek out the kitchen window and my food was gone, along with the plate. The utensils and the juice glass were scattered on the porch in front of the table, which I'm sure it got knocked over. I didn't see the thing anywhere, though. And thinking about it now, I think that that man or creature or thing is what went through the trash. I do really also think that if it wanted to hurt me, it could have. Didn't try to get in the house, just ate the food and left. So I've just been sitting here trying to wrap my mind around the situation. I started looking up information, too, and I found out that I could talk to you about this. It's still fresh in my mind, but there isn't really anybody I know that I want to tell. So thank you for being the voice for those of us who need to get it out but don't know who we can talk to. Thanks, Lilith. When I first decided I wanted to be a park ranger, I had this vision that it was going to be me and the land. I thought it would be peaceful and quiet. I soon came to find out that half the time I would be dealing with disorderly people. But still, I got to the point where I enjoyed it for the most part. This was in the early 2000s, and I was working as a ranger at Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio. When I started, I knew nothing about Ohio since I had grown up on the West Coast. A lot of the time, my job involved patrolling campgrounds and parklands at night to ensure visitors were complying with quiet hours. I also did a lot of making sure that no fires were being set outside of designated areas. I realized that there was no telling what inebriated people would try to do. I had actually volunteered for the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift when it was available. I was a night owl at the time. So one night around 3 a.m., I got this alert from one of the campsites saying that they couldn't find their friend. Part of that particular campground was out on a small peninsula. There were some coves and curved roads that made it easy to get turned around walking to the bathroom at night. It actually happened a lot. I got there, and the friends seemed a little more scared than usual. They said they had been searching for an hour already, and there was no sign of him. They did all smell like alcohol, and they all seemed to be about 18 to 20 years old. I didn't call law enforcement right away, because often a drunk person would fall asleep on someone else's chair or picnic table or something. So we were usually able to find them soon enough, and hopefully it wouldn't be a big deal. So I got to their site, and I looked around. They were all staying in a group site, all staying together. It was on a finger of a small peninsula consisting of five or six tent sites. They had five tents all around the big fire. There were beer cans everywhere, and the fire was still smoldering. The friend had been sleeping in a tent by himself while the rest were still sitting around the fire. Apparently, he had gotten himself too tired to stay awake anymore and had gone in his tent to lay down. They said around 2 a.m. they heard him rustling around in his tent. They went over to help him out to see what was going on, and he had walked into the nearby trees to pee, but then he didn't come back out. The trees were just a narrow strip of maybe 10 foot wide bordering the water around the peninsula, so there shouldn't have been much of an area to get lost in. We all kept calling his cell phone. It rang, but there was no answer. I did tend to worry about drowning, too, so I followed footsteps in the mud, which I was assuming were his. They then stopped abruptly well before the water, still in the trees. I looked around, and it didn't seem like he could have jumped anywhere, and most of the trees around there were too big to be climbed. The footsteps just ended. They didn't backtrack or anything. That was a little weird. We all kept searching. We all searched until about 4.30 in the morning, and then I decided to call it off, and I told them, let's just wait until morning. It was most likely that he had fallen asleep out of sight somewhere, so they all went back to their tents to try to get some sleep. I was way too wired to go home, so I actually kept at it. I was used to staying up all night anyway, and I just wanted to go sit down by the water and stay alert in case I noticed anything. On my way over there, I saw two things dangling down from a tree up ahead. 
and when I got close enough to see them more clearly, I just freaked out. I started backing away. They were feet, but they were not human feet. I just let out this gasp, and then all of a sudden, this thing swooped out of the tree like a bat out of hell. All I could think was that it was some kind of a vulture or something. It was gigantic, with probably a ten-foot wingspan, and it had flown down to the water's edge with these huge, leathery wings. It was at least as tall as me, and I'm five foot ten. And then it turned around and it looked at me with these red, glowing eyes, and all of this happened in a matter of seconds. I realized it wasn't any kind of a bird for sure, and it didn't look like it had a beak. It didn't even look like it had a face. I just saw darkness in these red, glowing eyes. At that point, I became really concerned about the missing friend. I lost it, and I just started yelling at the creature. It turned around, and it ran along the shore until I couldn't see it anymore. I was sure we were about to find a dead body. But then I heard this rustling in the bushes, and this half-naked person comes crawling out. It was him, the missing friend. When he was able to make sense, he said that he had gone to the lake to wash himself, and the freaky thing had scared him half to death. He'd been under the bushes, hiding, and had passed out. By then, I felt like I wasn't even in my right mind anymore. I was just fried. I took the kid back to the campsite, eventually got back to my office and checked out, took myself home. I couldn't take it anymore. I had no clue how to even begin making sense of it all. After that, I decided to switch to the day shift, and it ended up being a lot better for me. When I was 15, my parents moved us from our Chicago suburb to a tiny town up in northern Minnesota. My father had lost his job when the factory shut down, and he had a cousin who offered him work up there. I was obviously less than thrilled to be changing schools partway through high school, but moving to a freezing northern town made it a million times worse. My parents insisted that it was a beautiful area and that with the lakes nearby, there was a ton of outdoor stuff we could do. We moved in June, just after we had finished the school year, and as it turned out, the summer wasn't awful. It was surprisingly hot. My dad's cousin let us use his boat, and we spent a lot of time out on the lake. Dad took us fishing a few times, and we even started playing hockey just to fit in. And then, in the fall, school started. The new school we went to was ridiculously small compared to my school back in Chicago, but I made some friends pretty quickly, and I decided that I could survive these last two years before returning to college in Chicago. And then, winter hit. Winter in Chicago had been tough, so I thought I was prepared. Nope. This was absolute hell. The temperature was regularly in the single digits, if not below zero. Also, we were close enough to the lake that the wind chill dropped it another 20 degrees. I barely left my room most days, except for school or hockey practice. By February, I was going stir-crazy. And then by spring, we started to get warm spells, and out of desperation, my brother and I begged my parents to take us somewhere, anywhere. They ended up suggesting we spend a weekend at State Forest, about an hour away. Our parents had bought everybody kayaks for Christmas, basically as a peace offering for the move. And the park had tons of lakes and rivers, so we were going to kayak and hike and camp overnight. We got to the park Saturday morning with no problem. We found a campsite set up and then lugged our kayaks to the launch point. We kayaked around the lake for hours, taking pictures of wildlife and fishing and just hanging out. And when we returned to the campsite, we walked around for a little bit, then made a campfire and had dinner. Despite the abnormally warm day, it was still supposed to get cold overnight, so we had brought extra blankets, and lots of them. The kayaking had taken a lot out of us, so we all fell asleep right away. In the middle of the night, I woke up needing to go to the bathroom. I had ignored it for as long as I could, not wanting to get out of my sleeping bag, but eventually, I had no choice. I wrestled my way out, trying not to wake up my brother, and I threw on boots and my coat. The tents were in a clearing, but there was a small stand of trees maybe 20 yards away, so I headed there. I definitely wasn't going all the way to the campsite bathrooms. I didn't bring a flashlight because the moon was bright enough that I could basically see where I was going, and I wasn't going far anyway. I stepped a few feet into the trees and took care of business, 
and just as I was finishing, I heard a sound. Definitely an animal sound. I wasn't scared, just curious at that point. I was still getting used to seeing wildlife everywhere, and I had a running tally of the things that I had seen in the wild lately. I was hoping it was something cool, like an elk or a moose, or maybe even a wolf, although that probably would totally scare me. I stayed silent, waiting to see what it was. I heard a few more faint sounds, but I couldn't see anything. And I was freezing, so I decided to head back to the tent. Just then, I saw something moving between the tree branches. Based on how tall it was, I was sure it was definitely a moose or an elk. I thought about trying to wake up my family quietly because I was sure they would never believe me. But I was afraid it would be gone before we could all get back to see it. So I just stood still and kept watching. After a few minutes, I saw a flash of something moving again, and I heard it getting closer to me. It came out from between a stand of thick evergreen trees, and at first I couldn't figure out what I was seeing. I saw the face first, and immediately I thought, wolf. But the head was way too high, and besides the face was wrong, just wrong. And then out came the rest of it, and I saw the body. It was walking on two legs, and it was tall, at least eight or nine feet. The body wasn't completely human, and the arms were too long. It was slightly hunched forward, too. Its legs were muscular, and all four limbs ended in claws. The whole body was completely covered in fur, dark brown, almost black. The creature stared right at me with these glowing amber eyes that were far too intelligent. It opened its mouth, and it let out this weird half-pant, half-grunt, letting me see its razor-sharp teeth. That was enough to send me running. I screamed the whole way back to the tents, and I headed for my parents first. Of course, by the time they got up, the hideous creature was gone, and of course they didn't believe me. They insisted that I was either still asleep or had seen shadows playing tricks on me in the woods. But I knew. I knew what I saw. So back home, I searched online, and eventually I found exactly what I was looking for. Some pictures were different, but a few were almost identical to what I had seen that night. And they were all calling it a dog man. My family never believed me, but from that day on, I refused to ever go back to that park. My name is Randy, and I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. I saw and experienced some strange things growing up. One day when I was 10 years old in the summer of 1981, I was just walking through the old hood when one of my friends came running out of his house and asked me if I had seen what he called the hyena dog. I told him no, that I had never seen anything that looked like a hyena, so he went on to tell me about his dad seeing it and how it tried to kill one of his cats. I didn't think much of it until a couple of weeks later when I was walking home and I saw this ginormous humpbacked thing about 10 foot off the wood line in the woods. It sure enough was colored like a hyena, but it was big. There were about two square acres of woods between where I was standing to my driveway. I just froze because I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't see any legs or the head because of the underbrush, and apparently it had its head down, possibly eating something. I was not about to walk past this ginormous creature, but all of a sudden, anyway, it just took off like a streak of lightning. As soon as it was gone, I ran as fast as I could to my house. When I got home, I told my mom and dad about it, and they said that my Uncle Fred, who lived across the street from us, had seen it and then it had killed his white Persian cat. My Uncle Fred was a retired USMC gunnery sergeant and quite a badass. Dad said that my Uncle Fred was on the warpath. My uncle had a Saturday morning ritual of shooting handguns down on our land because there was nothing but woods behind us. Every Saturday, as soon as I ate breakfast, I shot out the back door to go down to where he was shooting guns, hoping he would let me shoot one. This day, when I got to the end of the porch, I heard one hell of a gun blast coming from my uncle's yard. My dad yelled for me to get in the house. I didn't know what was going on, but I was already about ten feet off the back porch watching my uncle Fred running down the hill yelling. Yelling, I blew that thing's head off. My dad was an ex-Marine too, and he didn't play around much when he told me to do something. 
He yelled my name again and told me to get back inside the house. I walked back up to the porch and Mom walked out to meet me. We watched my uncle walk down from his yard to the road and he stopped maybe 20 feet from whatever he shot. My dad walked toward the feed pile that my Uncle Fred had set up to trap this creature and he stopped maybe 30 feet away. My dad asked my Uncle Fred what he had shot and my Uncle Fred said, The heck if I know, it's ugly. Dad turned around and saw me and Mom on the porch and told us to get back in the house because we didn't need to be any part of what was going on. Mom pushed me on in the back door as we waited for Dad to come back from whatever he and my uncle were doing. So my dad gets back about three hours later, and he was not acting his normal self. I asked him what Uncle Fred shot, and he told me Uncle Fred did not shoot anything and not to ever mention it again. I spent a lot of time over at my Uncle Fred's because he lived just across the street, so I asked him what he shot, and he said he didn't know what I was talking about. But when I got home, I got a pretty good whooping for asking him, and my dad told me to forget anything to do with that day. A couple of years later, I got into some big-time camping in those woods, and we would always hear crazy sounds. Sometimes it was like a baby crying, and other times it sounded like a woman screaming but it scared the hell out of me and my friends. We left the woods more than once because of those noises, and my dad said it was just bobcats and that they wouldn't hurt anything. So one night, me and my friends were camping about half a mile back in the woods in a high spot above a creek that was maybe 150 yards away. We heard that freaky baby crying sound coming up the hill towards where we were. It was really cold that night because we only camped out in the winter but we did have heavy-duty army sleeping bags. We had a good-sized fire built, and I had my dad's semi-automatic twenty two with me, and I figured if something came up on the campsite, I was just going to shoot it. I turned around to look at my friend, and he was building all these little itty-bitty fires all around his sleeping bag. I asked him what he was doing, and if he had heard those sounds. He said, yeah, he heard them, and they were going to have to run through fire to get to him. I told him he was a moron, and I turned back towards the fire. That's when I saw two great big tall ears and two great big eyes, and I did not hesitate to shoot. But to say that my reflexes kicked into overdrive is an understatement because I was 50 yards away before my friend had a chance to sit up. He yelled for me to wait for him as he ran through the woods to catch me. I didn't even bother to bring a flashlight because I figured if something was crazy enough to come up on that fire, I didn't want any of it. We came out of the woods about a hundred yards from my back porch, and Dad was on the porch waiting for us, wanting to know why I had discharged my gun in the middle of the night. I told him a bobcat had come up to the campfire, and he started laughing. All of a sudden, you could hear the loud, baby-crying sound right on top of where we were camping. I looked up at my dad, and he had a seriously concerned look on his face, which was not common for my dad. He told us to go down in the basement and to spend the rest of the night down there. We went back to get our camping stuff the next morning, and nothing was bothered. We didn't hear any crazy sounds or anything, so we got our stuff and we left. The thing about what I shot at is this. In my head, I thought it was a bobcat because it was all ears and eyes but I never thought about how high they were off the ground. The eyes had to be at least three feet up, and that's no bobcat. I did not realize this until I heard so many different dogman stories. Was it a dogman? I don't know, but I don't see bobcats walking up to a campfire. And after those days passed, I never ran from anything else that came upon a campfire again. I lost track of how many times I heard those crazy crying sounds or a scream in those woods. But when we did, we got the hell out of there fast. We always just thought it was bobcats, and I didn't get a good enough picture of what I saw to say for sure that it was a bobcat. But like I said, its eyes were a good three feet off the ground. So as the years go by and my Uncle Fred passes away, my dad and I spend a lot of time together and I had already been moved out on my own for a couple of years. My dad would call me at least twice a week, if not more, just to go for a ride or to get something to eat. We were pretty close. So one day we were driving and talking about Uncle Fred and how crazy he was. We were laughing at some of the wild things he did throughout the years, and I remembered him shooting at that thing we called the hyena dog. 
I asked Dad about it, and he pulled off the side of the road the second I questioned him about it. He gripped the steering wheel real tight, and he told me he had already warned me about asking him about what happened that day. I was a little bit like my Uncle Fred, and I told him I didn't really care about what he told me 13 years ago, because back then I was a little boy, and now I wanted to know what happened. He looked at me, and his face was white as a ghost, and he said, Boy, I don't know what that was, but it was not anything natural. I asked him what he meant, and he said that he didn't want to ever talk about it and for me to please never ask him again. My dad was fearless, but this had scared him. After listening to hundreds of different dogman stories over the years, I believe that my uncle killed one and that he and my dad buried it. I think it was probably one of those hyena-type dogmen. All I know is what I experienced, and it was exceptionally strange, and I was young. In the years since then, all the land behind where I grew up was developed, and we never heard those crazy screams or cries ever again. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Do what you will with it. I know it's not typical, but what is typical when dealing with a possible cryptid? When I was little, my grandparents lived right next door to us. But next door in rural Kentucky meant half a mile down a dirt road. When I was old enough, maybe seven or eight, my parents started allowing me to walk to their house on my own, as long as I told them where I was going and made it home before dark. Our road rarely had any traffic on it, and it was safe enough for a kid to travel, but I liked to cut through the forest instead. The undergrowth was thick in most places, but I found a deer trail to follow most of the way. It was a lot quicker, too, than walking the road, and most of the time it felt safer. However, my grandma always warned me that there were things that lived in the forest that I wouldn't find in encyclopedias. Those things weren't to be trifled with, she said. I used to think that she was just telling me stories so I wouldn't go out at night and get lost. But when she heard I was going through the forest to get to her house instead of walking along the road, she told me one warning that would stick with me forever. If you feel something is not quite right, get out of the forest. You stick to the road, or you call me, and I'll pick you up if you want to come visit, she said. There's always something about them that's not right. Something you can't put your finger on. Something somewhere feels wrong. I asked her what she was talking about, but she never really explained it any further. I'll be honest, what my grandmother said creeped me out. I never went in the forest after dark, and I never saw anything weird in there. I continued to use the forest trail to visit my grandma. If I ever stayed after dark, she made sure to drive me home. I didn't give her words much thought, though, until one day after school, I was walking along the deer trail like usual, and I heard my grandma calling my name. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere inside the forest, though, and I couldn't figure out the location. I called back to her, and I asked where she was. She sounded distressed, and she just kept repeating my name over and over. She sounded close enough that I should be able to have seen her. I asked again where she was, but she just called my name back. In my head, I knew something wasn't right. She should have answered me and told me where she was. That's what she would normally do. And then I remembered what she told me a few months prior. Something, somewhere, feels wrong. And so I ran out of the woods as fast as my legs could carry me. I ran straight to my grandma's front door and I burst inside. My grandma was sitting in the living room in her favorite chair. I don't know if I was surprised to see her there or not. What were you calling me for? I asked her. I didn't call you. I'm glad you came to visit, though, she said. But Grandma, I heard you. In the forest, you were calling my name. She then rose from her chair and knelt in front of me. When did you hear me calling you? She asked. I told her it was just a moment ago, and her face changed right in that moment. She grabbed my shoulders and she said, That wasn't me, and you stay well away from that forest. You never go in there again, and if you want to come to my house, you call me. I'll come get you. And I listened to my grandma, and I stayed far from the woods. Years passed without incident, and my grandma kept her promise. If I wanted to visit, I called her up, and she came and got me. So one day I was at her house, and I was 14 or 15 years old at the time. 
I was harvesting and pressing native plants for a school biology project. There were several species of wildflowers that grew on my grandma's land, and I wanted to get samples. So I still made sure not to cross the threshold into the forest. I was close to the edge of the woods, but still in plain sight of the house. And my grandma was rolling out a pie crust in the kitchen. She most likely was watching me out the kitchen window, so I didn't feel unsafe out there. That is, until I heard my name being called from inside the forest. I ran back to the house, and my grandma knew by the look on my face that what I was about to say wasn't good. It called my name again. I asked my grandma what it was, what was calling me. I could tell she didn't want to talk about it, but at that point, I needed to know. She didn't divulge much, but she did tell me it was some sort of creature. She said it looks like a ghoul and that they live all over the place, usually rural, wilderness places, sometimes forests, sometimes caves, and they can mimic sounds that they've heard, animal sounds and sometimes voices, but they can't talk. They can only repeat things like a parrot. I asked if the thing was dangerous, and my grandma only said that nothing kind would try to lure you into the forest using the voice of someone you trust. And that was the last we ever spoke of it. I continued to visit my grandma, but I never ventured too far from the house. And I never heard the creature again. And I'm thankful I never saw it. Never. Though sometimes I do wonder what it looked like. I was so relieved when my grandma moved into an apartment in town. I sometimes still have questions when I think back to the creature in the forest. I wish I had asked her if she had ever seen it herself, or if it had a real proper name. How many of them are there, and why don't people talk about them? But she's much older now, and I don't want to bring those memories back to the surface, so I'm just leaving things the way they are, at least for now. I am well aware that I'm going to sound like an absolute lunatic here, but I swear to you that this is a true story and I wouldn't be telling it if it wasn't. I've never told a lie in my life. I physically can't do it. Five years ago, when I first got out of the army and moved to Kentucky, I decided to get a dog. I had long loved chows, so at the time I figured there was no better opportunity than to get one. It's hard to find a good chow breeder, but I managed to find one all the way up in South Dakota. She was a gorgeous red chow that I named Foxy. I got a good deal on her from the breeder because she had been saved back for breeding stock. But as it turned out, she was infertile. So she was already a year and a half by the time I brought her back to Kentucky to live with me. This dog was not used to the Kentucky woods. She had lived her life on the flatlands of the prairie, so every time we'd go for a walk in the wooded trails, she was eager to take off ahead of me and search the area. Then, every night, when we would get home, I would spend about an hour in the yard with her, picking the burrs and the twigs out of her thick fur before we got into the house. But on this particular day, we had been at the trails maybe an hour before the sky took on this weird, dark gray coloring and I started noticing flashes of light behind the clouds. It looked strange, like an unusual storm was rolling in, but in a really unusual way. So I called Foxy, and we headed back to my truck and headed home. Oddly, though, just a quarter of a mile down the road, the sky was clear. I thought about heading back, thinking the storm was passing over quickly, but Foxy was already in the car, and I didn't want to confuse her by heading back again. So we just went home. I grabbed a box of grooming tools and sat out on the porch to clean her up, and that's when I noticed that the sky overhead was now looking very much the same way it had when we were at the trail. Still, I thought it was just a strange storm brewing, and I called Foxy over in the hopes that we would get her cleaned up and in the house before the rain started pouring down. Now, chows are naturally nervous dogs, by the way so at first it didn't really stand out to me that she seemed anxious about the change of the weather. But she kept looking at the sky and taking in the distant flashing behind the clouds, and every now and then she'd let out this deep, low growl. I tried to reassure her, told her it's okay, but she didn't seem to believe me. All at once, though, I got scared too. I watched as something dark came down, lowering itself through the clouds. 
It never quite came out from fully behind them, but eventually it was close enough to the bottom of the clouds that I could see the shape of it hovering, just above the mist. It was large and round, and the flashing lights were attached to its ends. Foxy pulled away from me, and she ran to the edge of the yard, where she was now directly below this thing, and then she started barking up at the sky, and she was obviously protecting me, trying to chase it off. As she stood there barking, a large flash of light came out from under the object and a beam came through the cloud, zeroing in on her. She was right in the middle of it, barking away, and the beam seemed to be almost magnetized. There was enough static within the beam that her fluffy coat was raised, sticking out in every direction. And then there was this strobe light, dark light, dark light, flashing so quickly I had to squint my eyes to protect myself. It lasted only a moment. But when I opened my eyes, the skies were clear blue and sunny. There wasn't a cloud anywhere, and Foxy was gone. I ran over to my neighbor's house and knocked on the door for help. I just needed somebody else to be helping me deal with this. I also asked them if they had seen what I had seen, but they just shook their head no. My neighbor said she'd been home all day but hadn't heard or seen a thing, and that she was just now in the kitchen cooking. And that's when I realized that she was making supper, and I looked down at my watch. Four hours had passed. I don't know how I lost that much time. The strobing only went on for less than a minute, it felt like. And Foxy and I were just getting ready to head in for lunch when this all started. Had I really sat on the porch all that time, staring off at nothing? I had no idea how to deal with what I was experiencing, and so I headed back home, hoping to find Foxy back there. Luckily, she was standing on the porch at the front door when I got there, but she had this strange look in her eyes, and she was just standing, still, like a statue. But even stranger yet was the fact that her fur was still standing on end like it was when I had last seen her, standing, sticking out in all directions. To be honest, it was the better part of a week before she returned to normal. I don't have any good answers for what I experienced that day. I can only hope that whatever it was stays far away from us and that we never, ever have to experience it again. Hi, Lilith. The number of encounters I've heard on your channel has made me feel less alone, but also pretty horrified. I never realized how many people were having these kinds of experiences. I've been employed at a few different state parks around the country, but for the past 10 years, I was a park ranger at Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. I just retired this past September, but I do miss a lot of things about my work. A lot of it is just human relations and helping people with different situations that come up in the outdoors. Most of the time, it's everyday, common sense sort of stuff, but last spring, Something happened that I wasn't prepared for at all. Obviously, there's always been wildlife to deal with. We almost had to put down a bear that started getting too comfortable around people, but thankfully, it was able to be relocated. I've always been attuned to the sights and sounds around me, and though I'm cautious, I've rarely been afraid of much out there. In the summer before last, we had a remarkably calm season. There were hardly any critters we had to deal with, and it seemed the bears and pests were leaving us alone. Around April or May, people started to hear noises, though, around their camps very late at night. Noises that would drive their dogs insane. But nobody had really seen anything unusual. It kind of felt like whatever it was, was probing and checking out the area nightly. But it was staying far enough away that we couldn't see it with our spotlights. And then one night, when I was walking back to my quarters, I started feeling a profound sense of dread and unease. There was the most creepy, malevolent feeling in the air. I looked around, and I scanned the tree line before looping toward my door. I scanned the area from left to right and from my fire pit to the table. And then there, about 20 feet behind the table, I saw a naked, extremely pale, almost gray figure. There was this big boulder behind it, so it was kind of blending in and not easy to see. If I hadn't purposely been scanning the area, I wouldn't have noticed it. The thing had this humanoid quality to it. It was very lanky. It was still being very still, and it was directly facing me. And then our eyes met, and I felt my heart drop, 
and I just went cold. I probably only stared at it for a few seconds, but it felt like several minutes while my brain was trying to process what I was seeing. It was probably between five and six feet tall. The shoulders were low and slumped, and the body was frail and thin. It was crouched down on all fours. I couldn't make out many details of the face beyond its large black eyes, but its mouth seemed to be open, and it was making this strange clicking sound. It's hard to describe the fear and the shock that came over me. It was terrifying, and I couldn't think rationally at all. I slowly pulled my phone out of my pocket, and I snapped a photo, and that seemed to startle it, and I watched it jump up onto the massive rock and then climb the tree next to it. The speed it had was astounding. I ran like my life depended on it the rest of the way to my door, and I grabbed my shotgun and loaded it and aimed it at the door. I sat there with my heart hammering, waiting for the doorknob to turn or the window glass to break. I even called for backup. I sat there and I waited for what seemed like hours for two of my colleagues to show up. I must have sounded like a blithering idiot trying to describe what I had seen and what happened. I was usually really calm and collected, which is probably what made them believe me. The three of us were all armed and we went out together to look for it. We stayed out into the early morning expecting to see or hear something, but we never did. We didn't even see any foliage moving or anything. And then eventually around 4 a.m. we lowered our guard and we went into my cabin to try to get some sleep. The next morning I could hardly believe what I had seen the night before. I kept obsessively searching the area in the daylight to see if there were any shapes or items that I could have mistaken for the creature, but the only things around were my typical campsite things. I really, really wished that there could be another witness for validation. Not that I would wish the sight of that creature upon anyone. I had to make my report, but I had so little substance that I felt a bit ridiculous. I mean, there were no sightings by anybody else and nothing, and no one had been harmed. There was only the strange noises that people and dogs had been hearing, and my one sighting. So what could I really say? The photo that I had taken was dark and grainy, and you could barely make out the rock, let alone the creature. I kept watch again that night to see if I could spot anything, but there was nothing. That was obviously a relief, but also pretty creepy. The thought that this thing could be out there observing us was really unnerving. It was also really hard to want to warn people, but to not really have anything concrete to say to them. I'm wondering if I could have that photo analyzed by somebody. Maybe they'd be able to clarify the details. I tried to use some different filters on it, but it didn't really make a difference. Anyway, I never saw or heard it again and I had already had plans to retire soon, but I definitely think the sight of that creature made me do it sooner than I would have otherwise. Hi, Lilith. I don't know if you get a lot of college stories, but I've got one. My college was in West Hartford, Central Connecticut. It wasn't a big school, but it was big enough to need three residential halls. The smallest dorm was Mercy Dorm, which was just one floor converted for residential use in the original administration building. Mercy Building had more than just dorms, though. The basement level had a preschool where early childhood ed students could work for their practical credits. It also had the laundry room for the dorm at the very end of the wing. A lot of people wanted to get into Mercy because the rooms were bigger than normal and you'd be closer to the classroom buildings. Everybody wanted to skip the hike across the quad, but nobody but Mercy residents knew about the laundry room. The laundry room was freaky somehow. That whole basement level was. Going down there at night made you feel like you were being watched, and it didn't help that the school usually had only emergency lights on in the hallways when the preschool wasn't in session. During the day, it wasn't so bad. The hall lights were on and there was a little light coming through the basement windows. It almost looked normal. At night, the basement felt just plain scary, though. Everybody thought so. It wasn't the fake Halloween kind of creepy, either. It was, I don't know, it felt serious. All of us residents tried to do our laundry during the day. Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of machines, and even though we weren't a big dorm, sometimes it was hard to find a free one. 
which meant that you had a really good chance of having to go down to the basement at night. If you were lucky, you were just picking up your stuff. If you weren't, you'd be doing your whole laundry cycle at night. Nobody ever stayed there and waited. We just threw our things in and left. Maybe it was the exposed pipes on the ceiling that made it feel so freaky. I don't know. And everybody seemed to have a different reaction. Some people just felt nervous, but they didn't know why. And some people felt a cold chill. I guess I was different because that wasn't how I felt. I always felt like I was being watched. It wasn't too bad when there were two or three of us trying to do laundry, but it was really bad when I was alone. At first, I tried to shake it off because there was nobody in the room with me. And then I tried to tell myself it was just my imagination. I'd start singing or talking to myself, anything to make noise, to distract me. As long as I was making noise, I could fool myself. Everything was normal. But it stopped being normal every single time I went to the elevator. You know how elevators take forever to get to your floor? Well, this elevator was exactly the same way. It was one of those old-fashioned ones where you had to wait for the gate to open. And it took an extra long time to get yourself safely into the elevator. Yes, safely. Because every time I had to go between the laundry room and the elevator, I heard footsteps. They always started down by the preschool at the opposite end of the hallway, and then they started toward the laundry room on the opposite end of the hall, getting faster and faster until they got to where the elevator was, on the left side of the laundry room. The first time I heard them, I thought the janitor was down there with me, but I never saw him. I thought maybe I missed him, but then it happened again, and again, every time. I know, footsteps, big deal, but it was more than that. Just this sense of just, I don't know, a threat, anger. And the more I went down to that floor, the worse it got, until I swear I saw a face pressed against the little window in the elevator door as it went up. Was I freaked out? Yes. I started asking around the dorm to see if anybody else had heard or seen anything weird, anything they couldn't explain. While everybody said they didn't like the laundry room, and even some of the student teachers said they didn't like staying after hours in the preschool, nobody had had an experience like mine. I guess I was special. My friends and I started checking the library to see if we could find any old news stories that could help us figure out what was haunting that level. I never really expected to find anything, but I was wrong. In an old West Hartford newspaper from 1963, we found a report on an accident at the college. The old boiler had exploded, killing the janitor, Bob Gardner. Just so you know, the boiler was right across from the elevator in the basement of Mercy Dorm. Right across from the laundry room. I guess I hadn't really been wrong about the janitor being down in the basement at the same time I was. You'd think that having some proof that I wasn't crazy would have made me feel better, but it really didn't. The next time I had wash to do and I felt that creepy watching you feeling, I just started talking out loud. If I had a bucket list at that time in my life, talking to a ghost would not have been on it. And it turns out, just because you think you know somebody's name does not actually help much. In fact, it got worse. The feeling of being watched started to follow me up the elevator, three floors up, and it even started to feel bad in the daytime. But even that was nothing compared to that final night. I was trying to study for my English Lit final. My roommate had already finished and was out partying. All I could remember is staring at my notes on Chaucer one minute, and the next I felt this horrible pressure all around me. I felt like this cold force was surrounding me on three sides. And then I heard this voice whisper scream, leave, in my head. I'd never been so terrified in my life as I was then. I don't know what I would have done or what I could have done if my roommate hadn't come back just then. As soon as the door opened, the feeling and the coldness went away. Was I tired and hallucinating? Or did I get a visit from a very unfriendly ghost? All I know is that I grabbed my stuff and I hiked across campus to spend the night at my friend's room. As soon as senior finals were over, I packed up and I went home. I never told anybody outside my friends this story, and I haven't thought of it in years. But now I wonder, is Bob still haunting Mercy Dorm's laundry room? 
I can't believe I'm writing this, but I've got to get this down just so I don't think I'm crazy. My sister and I have always been close. When we moved out after college, we stayed in roughly the same area, so we made a point of visiting each other often. Until 2019, anyway, because she moved several hours north for a new job. I promised I would drive up to see her in her new place as soon as I could, but then the pandemic hit, and I had to delay my trip for about a year and a half. When I was finally able to go, I was so excited. I was looking forward to seeing her and getting some peace and quiet from my life. Two days before I was supposed to go, Janet called me, and she seemed, I don't know, a little off. She teased me about little things like remembering to pack my toothbrush and extra socks, but she sounded kind of nervous. And then she told me that it was very important that I get an early start so that I would be there before dark. I brushed it off because she's always made fun of me for being a late riser, but then she repeated it and said it was serious because the road to her house always gets dark super fast. She even made me promise that I would leave early to get there before sundown. I didn't see why it was such a big deal because I drive home from work at night all the time, but I figured she was just being a typical overprotective big sister, so I promised. We said goodbye and hung up. Fast forward then to the day of the trip. I set my alarm early, but it didn't go off, so I overslept and I had to start way later than I wanted. I felt bad because I'd promised her, but it really wasn't my fault anyway, right? At first, nothing out of the ordinary happened, but once I left the city and started on that long stretch of highway that cuts through the middle of nowhere, some weird stuff started happening. I'd look at the time, and then I would blink, and it would be like 30 minutes later. Or my radio would cut out suddenly or switch channels on its own. The longer I drove, the more frequent the weird stuff became. It started off slowly, but then it ramped up to something happening every few minutes. And then the sun sets. Okay, I thought Janet was over-exaggerating when she told me about this, and as you probably think, I'm over-exaggerating now, but I swear it was practically instantaneous. One minute it was sunshine, and the next I could barely see in front of me, even with the headlights on. It was like the night had just slammed down on my car. I must have gotten confused at some point, too, because I somehow found myself driving down a narrow side road away from the main highway that I was supposed to take. This road cut right through the surrounding woods, and the trees were practically touching the sides of my car. I thought about trying to turn around, but I quickly realized it wasn't possible. There wasn't enough room. I checked my GPS app, and I saw that if I just kept going for a few more miles, there would be a spot where I could merge back onto the main road. As I drove, I started getting this really creepy feeling like I was being watched. I told myself that I was just tired and spooked from the long drive. I mean, I was in the middle of nowhere at night, and nobody was out there but me. I managed to calm myself down, but barely a minute had passed before I heard the most terrifying sound ever. It was a high-pitched shriek, and I thought it was an animal, but somehow it sounded eerily human. It startled me so badly that I automatically pressed the gas harder. And then everything happened so fast. First I felt the car dip, and then there was a loud bang, and then I jerked the steering wheel hard to the right to get away from the noise, but the car just sort of dragged. I took my foot off the gas, my heart was beating so fast at this point I thought I was going to die. It took me a second to calm down enough to realize that I had probably just blown a tire. According to GPS, I was really close to the highway, so I called Janet to let her know what happened. She said she would pick me up, but she sounded really worried. She said to walk the rest of the road to the highway and not to hang up with her. I was just nervous about traveling alone and on foot, but it was a short walk, and I was still on the phone with Janet, so I did feel a little better. I had almost reached the edge of the trees when this awful stench hit my nose. It was definitely something rotten and decaying. I don't know what death smells like, but I'm sure this must be it. And then it happened. A blood-curdling shriek, just like before, but closer this time. Much, much closer. And it sounded like it was directly behind me. I turned around and I swear that for a second I saw a pair of glowing red dots like eyes, but then they quickly disappeared behind the trees. I freaked out, and I started sprinting for the highway. 
I don't know why, but somehow I was certain that something was pursuing me and that it was just letting me go because it wanted to. There were no more screams, but that horrible smell stayed. And after that, it was just a blur. I remember vague flashes reaching the highway, getting into Janet's car, walking into her front door. I don't think either of us said more than a few words. The next morning, everything was weirdly normal. Janet was oddly chipper, and she gushed about being so glad to see me. My car was even parked in her driveway with all four tires intact. I tried to talk to her about what happened that night, but she just kept saying stuff about how it must have just been a tiring drive and how she had always had weird dreams after a long trip. Maybe it was just a weird dream? Janet and I had a great time catching up and swimming in the nearby lake. Everything was perfect until it was time for me to go home. I hadn't gone into my car since I had gotten to Janet's place, and when I opened my car door, I got hit full in the face by this horrible stench, rot, and decay. It was the same horrible smell as that night in the woods. If this smell is real, then what else about that night is real? I don't know if I want to find out, and Janet doesn't seem to be telling me anything. Do any of you have any ideas? My wife and I are antique collectors. We live in Massachusetts near Salem, which isn't just a coincidence. We moved here after getting married. We both prefer things on the creepy side. Think Ouija boards, old dolls, clown figures. You get it. We've enjoyed collecting this stuff for the past four years that we've been together. We actually met at a creepy con when we were 21. It was nice to finally meet someone who enjoyed the same things I do. I don't enjoy dressing up crazy or anything like that. I just like the creepy things, and I have ever since I was a kid. About six months ago, we found this very old porcelain doll. We believe she dated back to the 1920s, but we were never ever fully able to verify it. She was very fair-skinned, with perfectly painted freckles and long locks of strawberry blonde hair and her porcelain face did have a fair amount of crazing. Crazing is what happens when the porcelain starts to crack. So my wife was really excited about this doll because she had the brightest green eyes that we've ever seen on a doll. We paid the $250 asking price and took her home. We even gave her the name Iris. Now, we love creepy. We love interesting. We do not love scary. There's nothing fun about being scared, and I prefer not to even think about it. So we bring Iris home, and we place her with the rest of our doll collection. We have this guest bedroom that has a day bed, and that's where we set them all up. We put Iris in the middle, but in the second row, since she was a little taller than some of the other dolls. After that, we didn't enter the room for about a week until my wife went in to do some cleanup. And I immediately heard her scream when she opened the door, so I went straight to the room. Most of the dolls had been knocked over, and Iris was still where we had placed her. I told my wife that it must have been the cat. We straightened up the mess and left the room. But this is where things get strange. You don't have to believe me. I know what I saw and what I experienced, and this was life-changing. Not only for me, but for my wife. We started to hear things at night, like something scuttling across the hardwood floors. I would then have to get up and go get our cat because we thought it was the cat. But every time, poor little Salem, yes, that's his name, was in his cat bed. One night, though, I heard the scuttling and I got up to go find Salem only to see that he was in bed with us. I told my wife the next morning that we needed to hire an exterminator because I thought we had mice. And then we walked into our living room and there was Iris sitting on the couch. She was in the same position we had placed her in on the doll bed, but on the couch. We looked at each other, and I asked my wife why she would move Iris to the couch. My wife claimed that she hadn't touched her, and swore that I was the culprit. But obviously it wasn't me. I grabbed Iris and I took her back to the guest room, and when I entered the room, I was shocked. All of the other dolls were on the floor, many of them now broken beyond repair. I started yelling. I didn't know what else to do. And then my wife came into the room. We were both shocked. We salvaged what we could and in the end estimated our losses at over $2,000. There were a total of 16 dolls that were broken, 
It was devastating. We didn't know how it happened. Did somebody break in that we didn't hear? Was Salem in there playing in the room? We just didn't know. We then reorganized the room and put Iris in a rocking chair near the window. We also decided that we would keep the door shut from that point on, just in case Salem had gone on a doll rampage. I didn't go into that room for about a month. I honestly didn't want to. It was way too upsetting to me. My wife, meanwhile, is a more logical thinker, but me? I'm thinking the worst. I start googling strange happenings with dolls, and I even tried to find out some of Iris's origins. I couldn't find out anything about her. Nothing. Not even any information on the company who made her. There were no records of anything that I could find. I told my wife that we needed to get rid of Iris, but that did not go over very well. I was told I was being ridiculous. I didn't feel I was being ridiculous, but then I just left the situation alone. We were still hearing scuttling at night even after the exterminator came and checked the house. We didn't have mice, just a small cluster of spiders in our laundry room. Spiders don't make that much noise. So now, I was spooked. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was extremely thirsty one night. I opened the master bedroom door, and when I did, I heard the guest door snap shut. I went straight to the door, and I opened it back up. The light from the hallway then shone in, and I could see that Iris was sitting on the chair. She was not in the position we had left her. Her head was tilted towards me, as if she was looking at me, and the chair was rocking. The craziest noise then came bellowing from my mouth, and my wife came from our room to find out what was happening. I told her what I had seen and how the chair was rocking. We closed the door immediately. I was now almost hyperventilating, and my wife said I was overreacting. She reopened the door. Now, Iris was looking toward the window, and the chair was rocking at the exact same pace. It had not slowed down. My wife looked at me and told me we were getting rid of the doll now. And that's what we did. We literally put her in a dumpster behind a fast food restaurant up the street. We will not be buying any more dolls. I enjoy not hearing scuttling throughout the night and not having my things broken. I think it's way better this way. So I'm currently sitting in a hotel two cities away from my house. Honestly, I am terrified, and I don't know if I'll ever even be able to return there. It's an older house that was built back in 1953 or so, but it's just beautiful, so maybe I will go back. I just don't know right now. I've lived there for two and a half years. I can say I've noticed some small things that should have been warnings. Obviously, I didn't care then. I do now, though. It's all starting to make a lot of sense. I've had times where I put my coffee down on my desk, and then when I go to take a sip, somehow the cup is on the coffee table. I found drawers and cabinets open, even though I obsessively close them when I'm done. I've heard squeaks, creaks, and bangs, but I always just figured it was the wind or maybe even the house itself since it's so old. Sometimes there was a slight knocking coming from the attic, but again I just thought it was the wind or something. More recently, there have been cold spots, like really cold spots. I made a mental note to have an AC guy come out and take a look. One of my friends stayed the night about a month ago, and they said that it felt like someone was watching them. They also swore that someone was sitting on the bed while they slept. I have cameras in my house, but not in any of the three guest rooms or the bathrooms. Anyway, this past Thursday, I came home from work at about 7.30. I brought home sushi and dumplings for dinner, and I turned on my favorite internet radio rock station and I was sitting down to eat when the air got extremely cold. It was freezing, like so cold that my glass of water frosted over. All of a sudden, my music stopped playing. I spun around to see if somebody had walked in and messed with my Bluetooth, but no one was there, just me, alone in the dining room. And then about 30 seconds later, my music blasted back on, way louder than it had been. I jumped about 10 feet in the air, it felt like, and I told myself that it had to just be the Wi-Fi connection, that it was unstable for a moment and then turned back. And then all of my food was on the other side of the table, exactly in the same positioning as I had left it. Well, mostly, I guess. I'm embarrassed to tell you this because any normal person would have left pronto. Everything was as I left it, but it was on the opposite side of the table. 
I guess I told myself I had just misremembered where I'd put everything. I don't know. I sat down to finally eat my food, thinking that maybe I was just overly hungry and not paying attention to what I was doing. But as soon as my butt hit the chair, I heard three extremely loud knocks from upstairs, just above the dining room. I ran up the stairs with my chopsticks still in my hand. I stopped at the top landing. Standing in the doorway of the guest bedroom was a man. He was almost see-through. He had this evil smile on his face, and his lips were thin and colorless, and his eyes were colorless as well. He looked sick. He was bone-skinny, and he was wearing dark overalls with no shoes. I was terrified. I've never been terrified before. I wanted to run, but I just couldn't. I couldn't even speak. I don't know how long we were standing there staring at each other. It seemed like forever. My heart was thumping in my ears, and I was freezing. The air around me was so cold I could see my breath. He moved his hand so fast. If I could have moved, I would have jumped clear out of my skin. His skinny long finger was pointing up to the attic hatch. I felt like I wanted to move. I wanted to open the attic for him, but I just couldn't. I didn't even see him move, but now he was standing only a foot away from me. And I heard three loud knocks again, but I couldn't tell where they were coming from. Somehow I gained the use of my legs then, and I bolted. I don't think I've ever run so fast, not ever. I grabbed my keys and my cell phone and got out of there. I don't know what happened. What is in my house? Is there something in my attic? Who was that man? I have no idea. I'm still reeling, and I haven't left my hotel other than to buy some clothes because I literally left my house with nothing except a set of chopsticks in my hand. I've been researching and trying to find help, but so far, nothing. My friends all think I've completely lost it. I even sent my camera footage to a few of them, and they just say it's a glitch. You can see me standing there, frozen, and then the video is just static for 4 minutes and 27 seconds. I checked my two other cameras' footage, and neither of them captured anything from the time I tried to sit down to eat the first time until I ran in to get my keys and my phone. It's just 9 minutes of static. I'm just really confused and terrified. I didn't even really want to reach out, but I felt so alone in this. Maybe knowing that someone has heard my story and has also been through something like this will help me. I know I have to figure it out. I only have four more days of leave time from my job left. When you think of Michigan, you probably also think of the Great Lakes. Or at least, I know I do. And naturally, when you think of the Great Lakes, you might have heard about how dangerous they can be and the possible creatures that lurk beneath the surface. But what if I told you that Michigan is home to something far more wicked? Something that lurks on the land? In the forests? Yeah. Honestly, I wouldn't have believed it either. That was, until I saw it with my own eyes. My house was sort of the party house in high school. Nothing too crazy, really, but definitely the house that all my friends would flock to during school breaks, where we could have bonfires and hang out. Usually bonfires were reserved for the spring or fall, given how hot the nights were in the summer. But I remember this particular summer night, a cold front had come in off the lakes, and the air was just cool enough that we felt inclined to gather up wood and start a fire. Our property was surrounded by woods, so my friends and I all spread out in different areas, doing our best to find branches that weren't wet and would easily spark. I was hacking into a dead tree when I suddenly heard this blood-curdling scream. My body ran cold, and without hesitation, I sprinted out of the woods into the backyard to see what was going on. As all of my other friends followed quickly behind, Kevin emerged looking particularly distraught and out of breath. He rushed us into the house and, between gasps of air, swore to us that he had seen something in the woods. He exclaimed that he couldn't even make out what it was. It was in the distance but that it was massive in size, black, and maneuvering on its legs almost like some kind of a gorilla. Now, I don't know about there being gorillas in Michigan, but I do know that there are black bears. And even though Kevin swore that that's not what this was, I countered that perhaps it was reaching up against a tree and just looked taller, as though it was standing on two legs. After some heavy convincing, Kevin seemed to relinquish to the idea that he truly did just see a bear and we all brought our attention back to the bonfire. 
a few hours had passed at this point and the sun was already setting. We pulled the pit away from the woods and closer to the house to further alleviate any weariness, and in no time the sky fell dark and the stars came out. We sat around the bonfire for quite some time, talking about middle school days when we had all met and become friends. Eventually, we pulled out hot dogs, sausages, and s'mores, and got ourselves completely full and fat and happy. Eventually, Jimmy recommended we play a game of what are the chances, and so we commenced the night full of that kind of fun. It started with harmless pranks like calling an ex-girlfriend, taking a body shot, jumping into the pool naked, but eventually it came time for Kevin's turn. As the story would go, Jimmy dared Kevin to go back into the woods by himself and face whatever creature it was that he saw earlier. It was clear to me Kevin was uncomfortable, and it made me upset knowing that the other boys would rag on him if this dare went unanswered. So, in an attempt to be a heroic friend, I volunteered to take Kevin's place. And without a second thought, I marched into the woods destined to prove to the guys that I was the manliest of them all. I trekked deep into the forest, and at some point along the way, I had the brilliant idea that I would hide behind a tree until the guys came looking for me, at which point I would give them a real scare. But minutes turned to what felt like hours before I heard any sign of life. The rustling, which I thought was coming from my friends, prompted me to peek out from behind my hiding space. And just as I did, my body froze. I was nowhere near prepared for what I saw next. Nearly eight feet tall, teeth snarled and sharp as razors and piercing eyes. But the thing that really made my skin curl was that this creature seemed to have the body of a man in the face of a dog. The head was covered in a mane of black fur with a protruding snout, while the rest of the figure seemed almost human-like. Wide shoulders, chiseled muscles, and human legs. I wanted to scream, but it was as though my voice was stuck in my throat. Honest to God, I think that's what saved me that night because this thing was not looking in my direction. And had I made any noise, it certainly would have. My saving grace was that I was probably thirty feet away from this creature, and the crunching of leaves as it walked through the woods, as well as its guttural growling, shadowed my labored breathing. As the creature made its way in the opposite direction of my hiding spot, I prayed in a way I had never done before. When the sound of the footsteps trailed off into the distance, I waited maybe a minute more before sprinting as fast as I could back to the safety of my yard. And then when I came barreling out of the woods, I finally started yelling to my friends, whose faces instantly went from laughing to concerned. I rushed everyone inside, told everybody all the details of the creature as best as I could, and, in an instant, we were all terrified. I ran upstairs. I woke up my parents, who, after a few moments of convincing, understood that this was not just some kid story, but something much, much more serious. The police were contacted, and by morning an investigation was underway for a man that looked like a dog lurking in the woods. The first time it happened, I was around eight years old. I had just moved into a new house, my parents were at this point divorced, and I had very few friends, and getting sleep was difficult. But this particular night was different. I fell asleep rather easily, but eventually, I woke up. I'm not sure if it was because I hardly slept before, or if it was because something had made me wake up, but needless to say, I wasn't surprised. But what did surprise me was the dazed, hazy feeling that I felt in my body. I could feel how heavy my eyelids were, so I knew I was still very tired, but that's when I realized the rustling noises. It took me a minute to really understand what was happening. As I mentioned, I was still very much in the early stages of waking up, but the noises didn't make sense, especially not after a long period of hearing it. I tried to see through my blurred vision as best as I could. I thought that maybe my mom had come into my room or that somehow the cat might have wandered in before I closed the door and went to bed. I couldn't make out much in the dark, but I did notice that there was an unusual shadow towards the end of my room, a bit over by my closet. I was still getting used to the layout of the room, so at first the shadow didn't really bother me. It could have been a chair, a stack of boxes, or something like that. 
I tried to look toward my bedroom door to see if it was open, and that's when I knew something was wrong. I couldn't really move. It's a weird thing noticing that you're in a state of paralysis, especially at a young age. It feels like you're strapped down tight or like you're made out of cement. And no matter how hard you fuss, you really don't get anywhere, except feeling like you're having the most intense workout of your life. As fear builds up and you don't really know what to do, you try to call your mom. Well, that's exactly what I did. I called for my mom. But to no surprise, not a sound passed from my lips. I started thinking, okay, I can't move. I can't speak. There's nothing I can do. In a sense, that gave me some relief knowing that I couldn't do much, so all I could do was lay there. That was until I realized that the shadow by my closet started to move. It's a little surreal because you start to realize how easily you can identify someone by a simple silhouette, even if you hadn't ever had to do it before. So in that instance of the shadow moving, I realized it definitely was not my mom, and it would be impossible to be the cat. Let me explain. My mom's a petite lady, maybe 5'1", if that. She had hair that was cut to her shoulders, and even though I considered her to be thin, she looked like she had more meat on her bones, because of how short she was. This shadow did not resemble her, not one bit. As the shadow moved closer, I could see more details. It appeared to have the shape of a female, and it was very long and thin, and it didn't appear to have much muscle mass and its hair was long but also very thin, just like its limbs. In a way, the shadow looked very malnourished, if that makes sense, and so this made me even more fearful because I couldn't identify what it was. Many things ran through my mind as I tried to kick and scream and move, anything to make this shadow know that I was able to do something rather than nothing. Was this a woman who came in for warmth? Maybe she doesn't have a home? Maybe she's just squatting? I tried as best as an eight-year-old can to create a possible situation for this person being in my room in the middle of the night without anybody knowing. But as I tried to reason and I tried to scream, the shadow kept getting closer and closer until inevitably she started to climb into my bed. That feeling, the weight of somebody else in the bed with you, that is scary. It was terrifying because it validated that everything my eyes were seeing was really happening. I could feel my throat start to burn from screaming even though I wasn't able to, but I kept trying anyway. My arms and legs were so tense and stiff, so when the shadow climbed onto my legs, it felt like it was more of a piece of plywood than a part of an actual body. But that didn't make the shadow's cold hands feel any better. I closed my eyes because that seemed to be the only thing I had slight control over, but I could feel the thing climb onto my chest, and then it pinned me down. It didn't feel terribly different since I already felt like a cinder block was on top of me, but I could tell that that's where she was. And then she started to put her hands around my neck. Or it felt that way, at least. A weird sensation took a hold of me. It was like she was sucking my breath straight out of my lungs. And it was very hard to breathe. So between the paralysis and the weight of the shadow and this feeling that she was sucking my breath out of me, I felt like I was suffocating was gasping for air, but I wasn't sure if I was even making a sound. And then suddenly, it all stopped. No more pressure, no more cold hands. I was able to breathe, but I still didn't move, and I certainly didn't open my eyes. I must have fallen asleep, because then the sun was shining through the windows, and I could finally move my head, arms, and legs. It was such a relief, and I had never felt so grateful to be able to rub my eyes and get out of bed. That was all just a crazy nightmare. That's what I told myself. But the bruises on my legs and my chest told me a different story. I've never fully recovered.